beginning of the period, it's, it's all very amateur, um, amateur gentlemen connoisseurs and antiquarians beginning to collect things and beginning to associate with one another. And at the very end of the period, you know, the beginning of the great national museum, you know, the full consolidation of the Royal Academy, the British Museum, and so on. I suppose we're just very interested in this period as a sort of transitional moment in which the you know, what, what John was calling, you know, the institution, which is often the name given to, but you know, various kinds of place. We talked about the placedness of these things as well, whether the status of having a venue being important. That the there's almost a kind of amphibious moment when uh, the institution on the path to somewhere um, you know might exist but that there might be gains and losses as things move towards um, the full public or national museum gains of access and objectivity and you know sort of the richness of the collection but also I I individual idiosyncrasy or the participatory quality of these institutions um, might be being lost so I mean and actually we just got on to Freemasons, which I think is a really interesting idea, um, not only in terms of the Freemasons themselves, but the ways in which all institutions perhaps might work a bit like the Freemasons, in the sense by bringing people together, allowing them almost to take on a different character, mm -hmm. uh, not only to divest themselves of their class and deference issues, but sort of allowing them to become a different kind of person, for them. Uh, but that, that being a kind of magical bubble within which mm -hmm. creativity, as it were, might, might, might happen. So about, about the way in which, in that process that you referred to, that regulation might yeah. go either way, <coughs> but that regula greater regulation um, might be damaging as well as creative, in the sense that, I mean, your, your Christine's point about Royal Academy, that so the more regulation, the more problems in managing the institution and problems of exclusivity as well, mm. uh, and of also it being being a point of um, of conflict against which other people mm. resist or define themselves. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, second group in the middle. Which uh, middle? I was thinking going that way. So the one with Matty. Well, we. I'm not sure we all agreed, um, <laughs> and others can, can come in. We, we did actually try to answer the questions on the exam paper. <laughs> <laughs> in the order. Um, but we began by saying that one institution that has seldom been mentioned here is the printed book and printed periodical industry, which uh, binds almost all of this together. And that it it's not just an Anglophone industry that there are translations and passages of information uh, between all the learned societies in Europe, that they, particularly in the absence of international copyright at this time. So almost everything of value written in France is translated uh, and, and, and vice versa, and, and with the Netherlands to some extent Germany as well. And then we wondered whether the, it would be useful to think in terms of producers and consumers, because the producers of many of these things could be regarded as an industry, as we talked about yesterday. But maybe the consumers formed um, communities, uh, certainly the, the, the readers of the you Quarterly know, Review and the Edinburgh Review probably regarded themselves as a, as a community and they shared certain values and certain ways that were debating. We wondered whether that would be a way of breaking down the concept mm. of categories that you suggested. And then when we got to, to London, which we quickly changed to metropolitan centres versus um, provincial places. And uh, it occurred to us that they all do actually depend upon metropolitan centers because they, particularly through the institutions of print, but also getting people to talk to them and um, <coughs> buying, buying pictures or whatever they do, that they, they, they cannot exist independently of metropolitan centers. 
but that they do have certain advantages relative to the metropolitan centers. And that we think in this period there is much more face-to-face -face interaction of those <coughs> communities than was possible in, in uh, London or in New York. So the nature of community becomes more there, um, the community is a more a distant community, a kind of Facebook community um, in, in, the, in the London, the metropolitan places, whereas in the provincial places it's much more face to face and, and, and there are advantages of both types. Yeah. That's how we go. Okay, thank you. And finally. So we talked quite a bit about the first question about what is a cultural institution. Um, you're interested in things that are sort of marginally cultural institutions in that sense, like the Founders Hospital, um, that rely on particular cultural formations and try to encourage them, but aren't producers of um, commodities, of cultural commodities. Um, and you're interested in how and why things get royal charter status, and how that happens. seems to happen a lot in the 1820s, that things become patronised from royal. Lots of things in London are called just royal as opposed to the London institution or whatever. Um, we were interested in London as a kind of neuron or um, central node for um, uh, institutions to spread out across the country and thinking about how lots of institutions aren't just based in London or any other one city but um, correspond so much they sort of exist in multiple cities at once. There was also that um, thought that uh, different centres around the country might face out, you know, face away from London in other directions, um, for instance, the transatlantic on the west coast or Edinburgh and contact with the continent. And I also, I, I also slightly question the face-to-face the, the -face idea, uh, because I, I wonder whether actually London might be the, the ultimate face-to-face -face, uh, culture in many ways, and that um, for many parts of the country it was, it was more abstract, the, 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 the interactions and the communication. Yeah. Um, we talked about the economic status of the kind of arts administrative mm -hmm. class. Um, how do people get such leisure time? Uh, did they have inherited wealth? Were they kind of professional men? Were they kind of nominally trained as lawyers, but people didn't really practice law, and so on? Um, and about degrees of um, sociability and fashionability, and how that interacted with their efficiency as runners of cultural institutions. Um, we talked about the difficulties of dealing historically with institutions where what you're interested in is 20 men sort of sitting around a table having a conversation um, and how that kind of falls off in between looking at individuals and looking at broader questions about a public sphere. And then we kind of got on to those big broader questions towards the end. Um, we were saying, why, have, why is no one going to talk about Habermas the last day and a bit? Um, what's, you know, have we sort of absorbed how um, Habermas is thinking or rejected it or what's going on with that? Um, is the big context which is the rise of a middle class um, is um, it, are we still dealing with kind of patrician institutions uh, we certainly seem to be dealing with very patriarchal institutions um, how do we account for the apparently very extreme absence of women at the senior levels um, of administering these institutions except perhaps for periodicals where they're um, actively involved as reviewers and editors but often anonymously those, those are the kind of big questions we're getting onto at the end. Um, I don't know if other people have other reasons. Okay. Thank you. I mean, one of the things that we did after the, the first workshop was try and produce um, a fairly short document with some of the sort of key ideas, and we, we circulated that and we got some feedback on it from people. And so I, will I am making some notes, and I will try and write something up um, probably tomorrow before I forget everything. Um, We've got, we've, but we've got five minutes or so. Does anyone who hasn't sort of spoken from the groups want to respond to any of the, the, the issues or questions that were raised? Maybe there's a point about um, how you get into these groups. I mean, do you have some qualification when you're saying that the RAS would be or the But do you have to have some knowledge? Eastern country before you even consider. Yeah. Yeah. 
Question. We, I, I think in the end we found that there shouldn't be a distinction between, is that right? B between um, what we might call cultural institutions and the normal way of things and other kinds of institutions. That, that cultural needs to be, we need to hang on to that sense of culture in, in the very broadest sense. But, um, Rather than producing cultural products. Yes. Yeah, so. I'm well, not quite sure <laughs> you came to that conclusion, but that it, it seemed undeniable that all of these types of institutions had cultures. And are they creative? Yes, um, it depends how you define creativity. It's very, very difficult um, to draw a line, it seems to us. Mm -hmm. I thought that issue, example of the family hospital, was particularly yeah. interesting. Yeah, and then we were, we were talking about the family hospital and then the scientific uh, institutions and the culture of science. Um, but in the family hospital, I was just thinking about how that sort of created its own community, but um, by 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 being both a, a, a hospice and a hospital and an art museum, um, it, it, it really blended many many different um, motivations and and purposes and created its own kind of unique identity, which you know it, it continues to be there. So it is successful in, in the sense of long lifeness. And it continues to be this very unique blend of different kinds of institutional motivations. And, and, um, I just so. the, the, the family hospital was obviously measured against European equivalents, um, which did do the same kind of thing. But actually, the um, I work for the uh, Royal Museum's Greenwich, and of course, across the road is the Greenwich Hospital, and um, which is you know very important architecturally, but it also it mimics in some senses the family hospital model in the sense that. In, from the 1790s, there was this move by Locker, who was the sort of governor of the hospital, to actually develop the idea of a major naval gallery, which is, was in the Painted Hall by you know, Thornhill, um, to have some 400 works of art, basically, whether you know, acquired or gifted, you know, 36 of which came from the Royal Collections, including the ma massive Battle of Trafalgar by Turner and the Newburgh Explorers Fest of June. In, prior to the National Gallery opening, there was the Naval Gallery of British Art, 400 works of art, 1824. And that, in, in, uh, <coughs> moving on from the Family Museum, of course, actually adds in the pensioners themselves who did guided tours of the Naval Gallery. So in fact, which of course did not happen at the Family Museum, you wouldn't have got the foundlings doing tours, but, but in, in which case you've got a very interesting community that is literally, you know, from the king downwards to the pensioners who have bought into this cultural center and they are yeah. actively engaging in it in terms of the public that comes to the door. And they got as many visitors as the Royal Academy um, Summer Exhibition. They had masses, and that is a lost history 